right. So uh, sorry for the interruption. Um, be sure to check our Twitter uh, account where we um, yeah posted the, posted the first raffle. So um, I wish you good luck. And now it's uh, Annie. It's your stage. Uh, Annie will show us about some new CNCF projects. Um, I'm really excited about it. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for the quick intro. Happy to Yeah. Um, what are the kind of um, good projects in general to try out and get inspired? Obviously, there's a lot of cool projects in addition to the ones that I'm covering today, but just to give you a glimpse of into the cloud native and Kubernetes world. Um, so to get us started, who am I and why am I speaking about these things here today? So I am Annie Talasto. I am a senior product marketing manager at Kamunda. Um, uh, freshly started a few weeks ago. Um, it's a process automation company. Um, and uh, I am a CNCF ambassador as well as an Azure MVP as well. I have also been organizing the Kubernetes and CNCF meetup for Finland for um, over four years now, but I am based in Zurich nowadays. Uh, I am also an early stage startup coach as well as co-host of the Cloud Gossip podcast that you can find at cloudgossip.net. Um, so that's a bit about me. Um, so let's dive right into the world of CNCF. So what is CNCF, if you're wondering? So it's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, it's part of the nonprofit Linux Foundation. And the goal is to host critical components of the global technology infrastructure. And um, how this is done, for example, about organizing um, the largest open source code developer conferences. For example, KubeCon is organized by CNCF. And most importantly, um, it is home to a lot of cool projects. Um, so, for example, Kubernetes is home to um, um, CNCF, as well as a bunch of other cool projects that I will be covering today. Um, but yeah, the mission is to bring together the world's top developers and users and vendors and um, just promote all of these topics in general. And I think the impact of cloud native tech is not a new thing for, for most people, but uh, just as a refresher, as well as if you are new to the cloud native world, um, here is some numbers to show the growth of cloud native tech in the um, years after this. So CNCF does this um, really neat survey every year. These are numbers from the 2020 survey. Um, so it's a survey that looks into the whole cloud native landscape. Every time I check it out, I learn something new. It's super informative, super interesting. Um, I highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in more of kind of the, okay, what is everyone using? What are the challenges everyone's facing in the CNCF world and so forth? But in there, we can use, uh, learn that in 2020, the use of containers in production has increased to 92% up from 84% and up 300% from the first survey in 2016. So that is quite a big jump in just a few years. Um, Kubernetes use in production has increased to 83% as well, up from 78%. So even though that there has been a huge jump already in use of containers and Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes still continues to rise um, and it is um, getting bigger every year. Uh, and then... Uh, you might be wondering, okay, that's the impact. Well, how does the landscape look like? And get ready for a bit of a doozy because this is how the landscape looks like. And it is quite a lot to take in if you are seeing this for the first time. It is 
very detailed map. Um, it is something that no one can really grasp when they see it, and even if anyone is really deep in the cloud native world, you really do have to take the sections by section because, you know, as you can see, no one can even kind of, well, you can zoom close enough to see the individual uh, projects, contributors and whatnot, but it is quite a lot um, to, to uh, take in for the first time. But no worries, we're going to have a bit of a simplified view today. We're going to approach it in a, a bit of an um, easier approach way, so no need to worry about this um, monstrous <laughs> amazing but monstrous image um, for right now and we're gonna just explore one corner of this landscape. So as mentioned before, um, there is projects within CSCF, for example, Kubernetes is there, um, and there is three stages when a open source project enters CSCF. So um, the sandbox phase is the beginning phase, so it's when projects are starting, they might have a maintainer or pew, um, and so forth, so it's very kind of early on. And when the project matures, they move on to the incubating phase. They get more maintainers, they get more committers. Overall, the community and the tech within the project grows. And then eventually you move on to the graduated phase when you are fully mature, fully ready for production, very big household name. For example, Kubernetes is in the graduated phase. Um, and the smaller projects obviously then on the sandbox and then going from there. Um, and just as a kind of... Um, refresher on how, how many these are, there's about um, 20 each on the graduated phase, there's about 30 each on the incubating, and there's about 50 to 60 each on the sandbox phase. The landscape moves constantly, but that's kind of the, the relative ballpark on how, how many projects are there within all of them bucket, so to say. Uh, and just for reference, when I started talking about these topics a few years ago back, there was only one or two projects in the graduated phase, so the projects are steadily moving and maturing along very nicely. Another view into the same topic, you can view this, there's a kind of this um, <laughs> uh, mountain, so to say, so when you start at the sandbox phase, innovators and techies are, and early adopters are using them, the incubating phase, more people are using, and, and after that, when you get to the graduated phase, you get to the late majority and the conservatives even, so it is, you know, you mature, you get more um, users, more committers, more community in general, and that's when you get there. And then, um, such as a disclaimer, this is not a scientific selection method. I do not also, I'm not a fortune teller, so I do not know what will be uh, in the future, the greatest, the best in a way. But I have chosen these projects um, because I'm excited about them and people around me are excited about them. And particularly for open source projects that live and breathe on open source committers, maintainers who are volunteering their time to work on these projects, for example. That is, I think, a very um, key aspect of how to determine what projects will survive and what, what will um, not, for example, move on that much. But at the same time, as mentioned before, there is plenty of great projects in addition to the ones that I'm covering here today. So um, there is so much more to explore than this session. And I do update this session regularly. So uh, if you're hearing it now, I will, for example, in the spring, I will cover probably completely new sessions um, once again. Um, and as an expectation management point, usually CNCF intro to projects talks are, are, are around 30 to 45 minutes per project. And this is talk that's covering multiple projects within a shorter amount of time. So um, obviously not a deep dive into any of these, more of an overview of the scene in general. Um, I will at least cover Linkerd, Kata, Flux, Kudo, and Mesher. Let's see how much we have time. And I also have a slides on Helm as well. This is, if this was a live conference, I would ask you guys, um, so who has heard about these projects and probably focus more on the ones that um, would be new to, to everyone. But since we are doing this virtual, which is amazing, by the way, it's great to be talking to, to people virtually as well. Um, we're going to just go by what we have the time for and let's see how it goes. Um, and it's a variety of projects from graduated to sandbox projects and from different kind of areas of cloud native world. So everyone will get something out of it. Um, so let's get cracking with the first project. And as mentioned, I will kick it off with Helm if there, uh, it is a relatively old project, but it is an oldie but a goodie for sure. And I think it's particularly great if you um, 
are new to the cloud ready world, for example. So Helen is the package manager for Kubernetes. Um, and obviously it's great for, for anyone as well. So um, what is Helm, you might be wondering. Helm is package manager for Kubernetes. It's like Homebrew, Snap or Chocolatey for Kubernetes. And one of the Helm maintainers, I think, put it really well. So package management is tooling that enables someone who has a knowledge of an application and a platform to package up an application so that someone else who has neither extensive knowledge of the application or the way that it needs to be run so on the platform so that they can use it. So this is really the power of Helm and, and um, the power of package management as well. So what are the benefits? So Helm helps, helps, helps you manage complexity, charts describe even the most complex app, provide repeatable application installation as well as serve as a single point of maturity. It has easy updates um, with in-place upgrades and custom hooks, and it has simple sharing, so charts are easy to version share host and host on public or private servers, and it also has rollback, so you can use Helm to roll back to an older version of a release with ease. So what are the principles Helm takes security very seriously? It has multiple maintainers, multiple companies backing it. As mentioned before, it is a graduated project. It supports Mac, Linux, Windows, and it's passed 1 million downloads a month already in 2019. So it's been big for a while. Helm is used by using charts, and the prerequisites are just to have a Kubernetes cluster, deciding what security configurations to apply to your installation, if any, and then installing and configuring Helm. And as a bonus, bonus project, we have Artifact Hub, which is a CNCF project, um, so it helps you find Helm charts easily. So um, back in the day, discovering artifacts to use with CNCF projects was quite difficult because every CNCF project might have had different um, Artifact Hubs and so forth. For example, Helm had Helm Hub. Um, so it provided a fair amount of repeat work because there was, you know, the, the, the landscape was scattered. Um, but Artifact Hub provide, attempts to solve this by providing a single experience for consumers that any CNCF project can leverage, hence why Artifact Hub is now the best way to find Helm charts. Um, so that's very nice. So bonus of the sandbox project there. And we do have a quick Helm demo here today. Let me get you to the uh, right terminal. We have three um, demos coming today all together. Oh, if I have the time, obviously, let's see. Um, so we have here, I'm going to show you two. So the demo is easily deploy complex applications, for example, WordPress to Kubernetes using a Helm chart. So here, I'm going to keep this demo off by just showing you that it is actually, you know, everything is empty. We're starting from scratch. So there I am logged into Azure. Uh, if I do kubectl get services, you will see that I have an empty Kubernetes cluster running and it's all empty, no nothing there. And we can do Helm list to see that, yep, there is no Helm releases either. So we know that we are starting from scratch. So now the next step would be to add Bitnami because we need that. But since I have done it before, it's not going to be doing that same. I'm going to be running through this demo relatively quick, particularly this beginning part. So if we do Helm search for WordPress, we see the WordPress um, charts available and we will be using the Bitnami one. So now that we've sh I've shown you that everything is in fact empty, we can actually do Helm install Bitnami WordPress generate name. And this is where the magic actually starts to happen. Um, so this is where we see everything being sprung up. So now before when the Helm list uh, was empty, now we can do Helm list again. Uh, and we see, uh, maybe we should see, this is something. Let's see, I have two, two zoomed in. Which is not there we go, now we see a bit better. Um, so we see there that there is actually a WordPress up and running there now. Um, so then we can actually go to kubectl get services to get the external IP. So we will copy paste this and pull it over here. And it will not have sprung up yet because it does take a few minutes. But do not worry, we have plenty of action to do while we wait for that. So now that we have gotten, you know, the external IP, we have everything being sprung up for us. 
we do actually because we want to start our for example our blog in this WordPress so we want to actually get started with that so to get that we need to obviously log into there um, so we can see then for example um, let's see here uh, here is the, the username we will use to log in and then to get the password it's actually quite simple so we do the echo password completely there and we get the password there so very nice and very easy so username there password there very simple uh, let's see that should be starting to load relatively soon um, but all in all, so what has happened within this demo? So we've installed WordPress and MariaDB to our Kubernetes cluster, configured WordPress and stored the admin credentials securely as Kubernetes secrets. So quite a lot of things happening in a short amount of time. And here we go, our WordPress is up and running. We see the hello world. And then if we wanna jump into the admin side, because we did get those credentials just for this, we will put user and we will put the password that we copy paste from there and that out. We're in and we could start working on our blog, for example. That simple is to, to install a complex application using um, Helm for Kubernetes. So that's it for that one. So then the next up we have Linkerd, which is a service mesh. It is a graduated project as well, um, and so I'm starting from the graduated and moving on to the more fresher project. So Linkerd is a service mesh, it's ultralight, ultra-fast, security first service mesh for Kubernetes, it's very community-minded, and the overall goal is to reduce the mental overhead of having a service mesh to begin with. And it provides observability, so service level important metrics such as success rate, latencies, reliability, retries, timeouts, as well as security. Um, so just as a quick uh, recap uh, from there, so it has a really thriving open source community. It's very welcoming, very nice, very cool. It has a simple and minimalist design. And it has, um, so it's very like no complex APIs or configurations, so it just kind of works. Uh, it has deep runtime diagnostics, so you get a comprehensive suite of diagnostic tools. Um, as well as it's ultra light and ultra fast, so it's built in Rust, and its data plane proxies are small and very fast. It installs in seconds with zero configuration, and it has actionable service metrics, such as mentioned before, so golden metric success rates for physical human latency for every service. Um, and the principles really um, are just that it just works. Um, it's ultra light, so it's the lightest service mesh. It's simple to reduce operational complexity, and it's very security first. And it also has its own proxy. So a lot of um, CNCF projects use um, Envoy, which is a CNCF project as well. But this proxy is built particularly for Linkerd, which is called Linkerd2 proxy. So what's needed to use Linkerd then? It's just this, and that's as simple as that injecting this so very light very easy to use i do have an option to do a linkerd demo as well but i think we want to do the keda demo rather so uh, if we have the time we could do it then but i don't think we will have but let's see how it goes but then before um we when we see we have a time with that let's hop on to keda which is kubernetes event driven auto scaling um, so this is a uh, incubating project in CNCF. So it's a bit of a fresher. It became an in incubating project a while ago, um, just a few months ish ago. So relatively new to the incubating game as well, and it's been in sandbox for a while. So what is Keda then? So default Kubernetes scaling is not really well suited for event-driven applications, and Kubernetes is more for resource-based scaling, so CPU and memory. Um, but this is where Keda comes in. So um, Keda is event-driven scale controlling that can run inside any Kubernetes cluster. So it can monitor the rate of the events to preemptively act before CPU is affected. You can install it into new or existing clusters, and it has extensible and packable scalers to grab metrics from multiple sources as well. Um, and you can install it to a new or existing cluster. Sure. So the Keda principles then are not to rebuild anything that Kubernetes offers out of the box, so offer something new, um, to be single purpose, simple and non-intrusive, and to work with any container and any workload. So I have the Keda demo that I that, uh, teased already, so I have scaling.net core worker with Azure Service Bus, 
Uh, and by the way, thanks so much for the Kata team for, team for the great demo. And this is an abstract representation of what the uh, the demo is and what did it do but you can there's the order processor order portal order queue and so forth but you can just imagine that this is simply a web shop for example that's due for a lot of orders in a short amount of time whether that be for the holiday season or for anything else you know when people need their stuff they need it fast um, and then we gotta switch um, the context before we hop 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 to this one Let's do the demo. So we gotta need this. We need this. And then we need this one. I'm just making sure that we are switching all of them here. Then we are ready for the demo. So then we will do QT Delegate Services namespace kda.net sample here so we can get the external IP to see our order queue. And then there is our order queue, we see its length, and then we do QT Delegate deployments uh, there. So that we see how many order processors we have ready, um, and then last but not least, we will do. This is to provide a bit of visibility. So we do keep see I get pods to see the history of what's happening within our environment, and then we actually get to the fun part, which is very fast and very fast. So this has just been all to see a bit of a better visibility into the thing when the, all the orders are rushing in. So when we do this command, it's going to act as how many orders do we want to queue? And we want 100 orders to be queued. And there it comes a tuna for Precious King. They're going to come, hopefully, yes, there we go. Cheese, table, car, salad, so many orders coming in at once. Our web shop is experiencing a rush. And this is where we start seeing the order queue springing up. So it's going to spring up all the way to the 100. Order queue is growing. We need to get all of our order processors up and running so we can actually start processing all of these. Uh, so here we go, um, order processors are pending, and they are uh, creating as well as running, and then we see here that there's at least one out of one ready here. All the orders have come through there, but we now see the order queue has peaked at 100. Um, so this is where Kata Magic starts to kick in. So we are at a four out of four, so it's auto scaling all of those order processors for us, and we don't have to do it manually. So it is creating them, as you can see here, it's pending and creating, and then we see here at eight out of eight already, the order queue is going down because we are handling all of those orders perfectly and well. So it's all nice. Um, we are approaching zero. We are at 8 out of 8, well, we are 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 9 out of 10. It's auto scaling up so fast, I can't even keep up with it. Uh, but now it's just more it's running and the order queue has gone down because we have handled all of those orders. We have managed to, all, you know, handle all of the gloves, soap, soap, towel, everything, and the order processors are at 10 out of 10. So this is the magic of Kata. It goes up when you need it and auto scales. And it's going to auto scale down as well. So we don't have to worry about that side either, but obviously um, it's gonna take a few minutes, so we're not gonna wait for that, and we're gonna continue on with our slides, but um, this is obviously great for both, obviously for um, not having any manual work to be done with the auto scaling up and down, as well as from there, also really great for cost management as well as the environment, because we are not wasting any cloud resources either. Uh, and then hopping on. So next we have Flux, which is the GitOps family of projects. So what is Flux, you might be wondering, or what is GitOps? So Flux is an um, incubating project, but it's one of the most major um, developing projects within the cloud native um, ecosystem. So it's actually recommended by CSEF Technology Radar already. So if you're wondering what is GitOps, so you have all of these um, CLI tools, for example, kubectl apply, kubectl set image, and all of these. It replaces all of these with just one CLI tool, which is Git. So it goes to the Git push. So instead of 
changing the state of your cluster with multiple things. You can use just one command to modify something and push it to the Git repository, and uh, it goes to the cluster from there. Um, and Git is really nice as well because you have a nice history of what happened to your cluster as well. So it really provides one model for making infrastructure apps and Kubernetes add-on changes, and you have consistent end-to-end workflow across your organization. So what this means in a nutshell is that you have an easy snapshot of your cluster that you can restore to, so if anything happens. So uh, you have, if you lose a cluster, you just plug your new cluster to Flux and you restore everything. No stateful sets on our databases, obviously, but everything that was in the Kubernetes memory essentially is restored. So to simplify things, the desired state that stayed in the kit is not the actual thing, but the desired state. So kind of like a save point that you restart. So why Flux is then great for GitOps? So it really aims to provide a complete continuous delivery platform on top of Kubernetes, uh, supporting all the common practices in the field. So for example, customized Helm that we talked already before and Prometheus and so forth. Um, so what are the Flux practices and benefits? So uh, it has defined GitOps practices really well, where you have to describe your system declaratively, keep configuration under source control, use software agents to reconcile and ensure correctness and alert for drift. And the benefits are collaboration in intra access control, audible history, drift correction, clear boundaries between dev team and Kubernetes as well. So that's Git, very uh, cool uh, incubating project. Then hopping on to the next one, we are on a roll here with this project, which is CUDA, which is the Kubernetes Universal Decorative Operator. So CUDA really kind of goes into this stateless uh, versus stateful app. So if all apps were stateless, everything would be really some simple. And, but stateful apps um, need logic, specific knowledge to run a certain application. Um, and Kubernetes has been very focused on stateless apps, and stateful apps do not really like it that much. Uh, so uh, stateful sets were created to um, uh, fix this issue, but it does not really solve the fundamental issue, so then operators were introduced. So operators are man manage and monitor the life cycle, it, but it requires a lot of custom knowledge to build an operator. Um, so it might require thousands of lines of code, substantial engineering resources really needed to build the operator, and often operator framework or cube builder is used. Um, but this is where CUDA, which is Kubernetes Universal Decorative Operator, comes in. So rather than using a custom operator, CUDA provides a universal operator with the concept of the plans built in. So the benefits are obviously, so the CUDA can create operators without needing a deep knowledge of the Kubernetes or coding just by defining the life cycle stages. Um, it's just Kubernetes APIs, so it's a lot easier to learn. Um, and it has Kubernetes native management, aka using kubectl and other familiar tools. Uh, so it's really nice and very beneficial um, for operator creation. That was CUDA then. Uh, oh, no, I went a bit too fast. So CUDA is a sandbox project. So it's early on on its life cycle, but very nice. Then the newest project of this slide set of this session is, and the last actually as well, um, so Meshery, the service mesh management plane. So it's sandbox, it's very new to the sandbox, it went up to the sandbox a few months ago during um, late fall-ish summer, so forth. Um, so Meshery, so what is Meshery? So it's a service mesh management plane. So we talked about Linkerd before, which is a service mesh. So Meshery is, um, in the same frame, kind of. Um, so service mesh is the control plane and the data plane, but then the meshery has a management plane there. So why does this is needed? So you might, if you end up in a situation where you need multiple service meshes, so you might have legacy reasons, personal preference of team members. Um, if you just happen to have um, like Linkerd and Istio in the same cluster, things might get a bit difficult. Um, but then meshery helps with these issues. Um, because it uh, provides federation, integrates with backend systems, may help perform chaos engineering, deeper insight into the performance, and long list of things that are possible to do. Um, even though Meshery is very new, so it's a very new sandbox project, it is very community first, and it is actually already the most popular project in the Linux Foundation mentorship program, and it already has 15 maintainers and 300 plus contributors, so very fresh, but very, um, very um, active community in there. 
So Meshery supports over 10 different service meshes and it has multi-mesh management. So it manages lifecycle, workload, performance, configurations, patterns, and practices, and chaos and filters. And Meshery is about halfway through a complete architecture at the moment. <laughs> so uh, now that we are approaching our time, um, uh, let's get into the wrap-up mode. So we went to see and what have we covered in today's session. We have gone through a CNCF overview. We have covered actually Helm, plus Linkerd, Kudo, Flux, Kada, as well as Meshery. And we did do a um, Helm as well as Kada demos as well. And as always, uh, great learn more resources are available. So you can check out the CNCF survey. All the projects are really great sites with great documentation and more info there. Highly recommend supporting your favorite project in GitHub because open source uh, ecosystems need that definitely. Um, if you're interested in more of the business side, um, CNCF has really great case studies where you can see how these projects are used in real life. Um, the CNCF and user technology radar that I mentioned with Flux is a great resource to finding out what are the different texts that are recommended at that moment for a particular area from CNCF. And if you are interested in how does uh, the Technical Oversight Committee of CNC view the future, um, the Technical Oversight Committee Chair Liz Rice does a really great session in all of the KubeCons, um, diving deeper into there. If you are new to the cloud native world, I highly recommend checking out Tech World with Nana. And then um, if you want more, CNCF YouTube has a really great resources. For example, all of the KubeCon sessions are posted to CNCF YouTube. I spoke at KubeCon for uh, North America as well, so if you're interested in that session, you can find it from there as well. As always, I will post all of the links and slides to my GitHub so you can um, access them from there. If you, you know, later on today realize that, damn, I should have uh, copy pasted that one link or something to save, then you can always find it there. Um, final note, um, my podcast we did an episode with Tom Kirkhoff um, on, um, so he's one of the maintainers of Kada, so he was talking about well, how does it feel to be a maintainer of uh, the CNCF project, Sandbox projects at that time, so if you're more interested in that side, I highly recommend checking that out for sure. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone has taken a lot of inspiration and interesting viewpoints in, from this session and learned something new uh, at all different levels. So um, I hope everyone enjoyed it a lot. Um, and you can always find me on Twitter as well. You can see my Twitter handle there on the bottom right corner. Um, so check that out. I usually retweet a lot about cloud native and Kubernetes topics and whatnot. So uh, if you have any questions, I can also answer them there. Uh, but that is from me for now. We are at time. I hope everyone has enjoyed it and has a wonderful conference day. Um, it's been lovely talking with you today. All right. Ani, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I will definitely... Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> it's better now? Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I will definitely check out the, the podcast with Tom. Looking forward for it. And yeah, everyone else, uh, we will have a small lunch break now. And at 12.25, uh, Damir Dombridge will present us something about uh, best practices um, regarding uh, serverless applications with, uh, let me check, Azure Functions, Docker, and the Azure Container Instances. All right. So, Annie, have a great day. And see you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.